Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is David Godwin and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange program with the University of Florida. From our Southern Fire Exchange team, I'm joined today by Mary Nell Armstrong with Tall Timbers Research Station. We're excited about our webinar today and I'm glad you're here. Today we have a presentation by Dr. Brad Kubechka from Tall Timbers Research Station and he'll be talking about bobwhite quail management in the southeastern U.S. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Brad Kubechka is the director of the Western Piney Woods Quail Program at Tall Timbers based in the Piney Woods ecoregion of Texas. For the past two years, he's also served as the executive director of the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation. Brad's research has focused on bobwhite quail brood ecology, population abundance estima estimation, reintroduction and translocation, and bobwhite disease ecology. Brad lives in Magnolia, Texas with his wife, Christine, and three bird dogs. So welcome, Brad. Thanks for joining us today. I, we have over 100 folks on the line, so we are excited uh, and looking forward to your presentation. So welcome, everybody. One second as we just trade out slides, uh, and, and Brad gets going. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Godwin, and thank you all for uh, joining me today to talk about uh, something that's really near and dear to my heart. That's Bob White management in the southeast with uh, emphasis on fire. So uh, what I want to do today is really start uh, with a little bit of story time, because quite frankly, who doesn't like a good story? And it's a story of our genesis at Tall Timbers and how Bob White, fire, and our game bird program are all inextricably linked. And then what I want to do is move into learn a little bit more about the bird, because I feel like before we really talk about fire application for Bob White and how we, we apply or apply fire specifically for Bob White, we have to understand a little bit more about the bird. So we're going to be talking about demographics of Bob White, um, predominantly from uh, data that's been collected in the southeast and namely North Florida and South Georgia. I'm going to have a heavy focus on survival and reproduction and then some space use stuff, movements and what birds use as, as far as, as habitat. And I really focus a lot on survival and reproduction because these are the things that make a population tick. Um, birds coming into, out of a um, population through births, deaths, immigration, and immigration. And then finally, at the very end, uh, once I've got, got you through all that, we're going to be talking about fire application and how how we apply fire can affect survival and reproduction. And ideally, we want the way we to apply fire to increase survival, um, reduce predation risks, increase reproductive opportunity. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So without any uh, further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I want you to start by imagining that it's the late 1800s, early 1900s. This civil, civil war has just ended and we're in the Old South um, in an area between Tallahassee, Florida and, and, and Thomasville, Georgia. And uh, we came down to this, this region from, from the North, from New York and um, during reconstruction to start buying up cheap property and help in that reconstruction phase. Uh, the winters are mild. And when we get down here, what we notice is that the Bob White hunting that reminds us of kind of the aristocratic old world bird hunting with pointing dogs and, and a flushing type bird like partridge, um, the Bob White resembled that. So, uh, you know, we find all these properties and a lot of our friends start buying up all these, these lands. Uh, today, we, we colloquially term these areas the, the Red Hills quail hunting plantations or Red Hills properties. And uh, so this is the late 1800s. And, and when, when these folks came down and they saw this pristine condition, something that they really enjoyed, the experience, the balmy pine air and things that they thought were therapeutic, they took a preservationist approach to, to management in that they didn't want to mess it up. They thought it was, it was excellent and beautiful. And so they bought up um, all this property mass, this, this large area, of almost a half million acres. And then within a matter of maybe 10 years, the population starts to decline. Now, a lot of times we're all familiar with Bob White populations, um, you know, declining over the last 50 or 60 years. A lot of us kind of date it back to that time period, but this was the turn of the 20th century. This is the early 1900s. And, and what the landowners were realizing was that the quail populations weren't what they were. 
when they had first bought the properties. So they said, we got to do something about this. So they, they sought to do a study to understand what was going on with their birds. So they found a guy by the name of Herb Stoddard. And Herb Stoddard grew up in Florida as a child and uh, spent his teenage years in Chicago and uh, was a naturalist all the while growing up on the land and even in Chicago working as a taxidermist and in, in, in the Natural History Museum there. So he had this fondness for that part of the world and uh, Stoddard was held in high regards for a lot of these, um, these property owners. So uh, he took the challenge of, of doing a study down there. So he gets down there and and one of the first things that he realizes is that uh, the woods weren't managed the way they were when he was a kid. A lot of the folks had stopped burning. And uh, he had he'd grown up in the late 1800s. He saw the cutting of virgin longleaf. He had, had saw uh, the, the conditions of uh, pre-Civil War, the conditions when uh, a lot of those fields were farmed uh, for cotton. And, you know, th those folks that were the, the farmers had to export to, they had to find new goods uh, as far as, uh, or, or new new importers. They, um, so those fields went fallow. And, and what he noticed that, what he noticed was that uh, these folks weren't doing a lot of those things, uh, farming, or they, they took a hands-off approach. So um, he started his study, um, suspecting that might have some to do with it, but uh, his study really looked at a lot of things. Um, he looked at uh, diseases and parasites. They looked at uh, life history characteristics of Bob White. Just anything that you can think of, they studied it. And he published his results in um, what we know today and our Bob White enthusiasts call the, the Bible of Bob White management. The book, The Bob White Quail, It's Habits, Preservation, and Increase. It's probably two inches thick, and it was published in 1931. For all you wildlife enthusiasts out there, that's two years prior to game management by Leopold, who identified the axe, the plow, the match, and the cow as indelible or very um, important tools on the landscape. And uh, I can't help but think that Stoddard had some influence on, on Leopold and, and his thinking on fire. The two were contemporaries and friends, um, actually, and one of Stoddard's actually most prized possession he ended up writing in his memoirs was a, was a longbow that Leopold had actually made him. Um, before passing away, but not to digress too much. Uh, the, what, what Stoddard noted in his book was that um, fire was incredibly important for Bob White and where he caught them. And so at the time, we didn't have telemetry or GPS or anything like that. He was um, doing studies predominantly with banding. And what he noticed is that where he caught birds, it was areas that were recently disturbed or burnt over. And areas that weren't burnt over, uh, he wasn't catching any birds. And he suspected that that um, verified kind of his suspicions about the lack of fire on the landscape. And he wrote this in his book. It was pretty taboo at the time. This is a time when um, there was an anti-fire sentiment. Um, you know, a lot of folks were trying to stamp out fire in the Southeast. And so it was, it was really a challenge to get some of these ideas published, uh, not so much maybe with the, the private funders, but some of the partners. But eventually it was published in its, in its form that was somewhat watered down. And later um, Stoddard wrote that he wished he had kept more of what he had uh, written um, in there, but he, he understood that fire was incredibly important. So the, the plantations continued to use fire to manage for quail. And then over the next couple of decades, they uh, learned more about applying fire. And uh, one other thing that he mentioned in his book maybe one of the most important things, uh, at least for Tall Timbers Genesis, is that he noted that what we really needed in the Southeast was an experiment station in which we could study the effects of fire on plant and animal communities. And I don't think he said this flippantly because uh, there's a lot of folks in that, that area that respected Stoddard. Um, and I think that's really something that he did once. So, you know, fast forward through World War II and and things that were going on at the point that, and during that time, this, this study was over. Um, but Stoddard was still working in the area as a forester and um, still doing some, some bird research. And he was good friends with a gentleman by the name of Henry Beetle. And in 1958, Mr. Beetle um, said, you know what, that we, we do need an experiment station 
on uh, that we can study fire on plant and animal communities. So in 1958, Tall Timbers was gifted, uh, Tall Timbers Plantation, which was Henry Beadle's plantation, was gifted to Tall Timbers Research Station. And the rest is really history. And so starting in 1958, a lot of the research at Tall Timbers was fire focused on, on plant, plant life predominantly. And it was in the 1980s, late 1980s and early 1990s that the game bird program at Tall Timbers was really, really uh, revolutionized. Predominantly by this little tool that the two gentlemen here are, are tying to that bird. The gentlemen there is, uh, are Brad Mueller and Smiley Shields, who developed the VHF transmitter that we attached to Bob White that allow us to track movements and monitor things like survival and reproduction. And it was with this ability to track birds almost any time of the day, whenever we want, um, that we began amassing a data set that we could compare things that made a population tick, survival and reproduction, movement, space use. Um, we could compare those in relation to our management. So how we burned, we could look if we burned one way here or here, what the effects were on survival reproduction, if we were doing feeding or any kind of predator control. So it was in that time period that, that we really hit our stride, I guess, over the last 30 years. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today is really some of the data that we've, we've learned over the, uh, the information that we've learned from that data over the last 30 years, predominantly from North Florida and South Georgia. Now, just because these studies were predominantly done in those areas, they're applicable to most of the southeastern coastal range with a few rare exceptions. And what I want to do is really focus on the principles rather than the prescriptions or the practices but I'll explain how context in different regions and different areas um, could play into what I mean by that and, and, uh, and where those exceptions might be important. So let's talk a little bit more about the bird, what we've learned. Um, so we'll start with survival. And the two graphs to the right are from some of our long-term studies at Tall Timbers in the Game Bird Program. The top right graph is from Tall Timbers itself, and the bottom right graph is from Albany Quail Plantation main research site. And what I want to point out is that these populations are considered stable over the long term. They have some fluctuations uh, from year to year, but over the last 70 years or so, they've only been stable or actually increasing. And what we see now, there's only 10 years of data or so. Uh, presented there, but we see in these stable populations that we only have about 20% annual survival, and it rarely exceeds 30% annual survival. So it's very rare to have 30% of our population survive from one year to the next, even in a stable population. So if we enter the nesting season, say April 15th, what we usually demark as the start of nesting season in the Southeast, if we start the the nesting season with 100 adult birds. Next year, at the beginning of the next nesting season, we'll have 20 of those left on average in a stable population. We typically see a little lower uh, annual or a little lower survival from our adults during the nesting season and the overwinter period. So uh, if we start with those 100 birds, we make it through the nesting season, we have 40. And then over the winter, um, we'll lose about half of those. So that's where we get our 20 um, starting at the next year. The number one leading cause of mortality for Bob White is predation. That's not to be confused with ultimate and proximate causes of the, the overall decline across their geographic range. Um, but predation is the number one reason that we pick up radio transmitters in the field. Now, that being said, our management um, here today, we're gonna be talking about fire mostly, um, our management can either reduce or exacerbate those risks of predation. Um, so that, that's important to remember. So they have this really low survival. How do we sustain populations? Well, it has to be with really high reproduction. So if we start it with 100 hens on the April 15th on, a, on an average year that we don't see much population growth or, or decline, we might see about 75, hen, 75 nests from those 100 hens. And about half of those will actually hatch, and that's in good habitat. Now, there's been some reviews out there in the early 2000s where we've looked at nest success across a wide range of studies, increase and decreasing, and those reviews suggested that nest success was 28%, but that included declining populations. So 
Um, but that's still a stark number. Only about half the nests that are actually laid will actually hatch. So that's important. So when does this occur? We, we said um, usually it starts around April. Well, nesting season actually depends on where we're at. So the graph to the left has two research sites, uh, the Escape Ranch in Central Florida and Tall Timbers. And what the lines denote, the gray lines, is the distribution of nests throughout time. And what we see is that nesting typically starts in March in those lower latitudes. And uh, we'll have about 81% of our nest already laid by June. Whereas in North Florida, a couple hundred miles north, uh, we might not start until April or May. And then our 81% of our nest are most of our nests are laid by July. So things are delayed a little bit. Now this is important when it comes to fire timing. Um, plant phenology is different in each of these areas or the timing which plants are, are growing and, and uh, flowering. And so, and also the timing in which nesting is occurring is different. So this might actually um, indicate the time of year in which we should be burning. And uh, not to get too far ahead, ahead of myself, but typically on the the quail properties in the Red Hills, we're, we're burning in April and May uh, and March as well, predominantly March and April and sometimes into May. Whereas in Central Florida, they might start in February and March. Now these are areas that already have um, birds and we'll get to other exceptions um, to those rules a little later on on fire timing. But um, we'll keep this in mind about when the bulk of the nests are being laid. Typically, we hear a lot of times that, well, if we burn up a nest um, or if a nest is lost, uh, they'll just re-nest. Yes, sometimes. Actually, it, there's a range of re-nesting attempts and typically about 20 to 50%, we have about a 20 to 50% chance that if we have an unsuccessful first nest, that that hen will actually re-nest. So we don't necessarily want to put them these birds in a situation in which they have to re-nest. So we wouldn't wanna get all of our burning necessarily done in June or July. Um, we have to maybe space that out and take into consideration when all this is happening. Because what we know is that one, uh, they don't always re-nest while they will sometimes. Sometimes they'll nest up to four times in a, a single nesting season, but not always are they successful nest and not always do they re-nest. And typically the first nest, uh, first nest attempts have uh, greater clutch sizes um, compared to second, third, or fourth attempts. And we also see that if we delay that nesting later in the year, that those clutch sizes go down as well. So even if it's the first nest um, late in July, it's typically gonna be a smaller clutch size at average number of eggs per clutch is gonna be lower than say if that, that hen would have laid in May or June. So this is just a little context as we go into fire timing a little later on. So as I mentioned, a lot of these data are taken from the Southeast and in North Florida. Um, these are areas that are characterized by a two year fire return interval. And for most of the Southeast, I'd say that far Bob White, we wanna burn on a two year fire return interval. There are exceptions to this rule, um, maybe in Zurich Flatwoods or, or different areas like that. But uh, for, for the most of the Southeast, we're gonna be burning on, on a two year fire return interval. And so with that in mind, um, for our nesting, typically we see about 70% of our nest laid and hatched in blocks that were burned the previous year, and about 25% of our nest hatching in, in burned patches, patches that were burned the current year. And typically we see those later in season coming on. And then some are also usually uh, hatched in fields and uh, hardwood drains and other types, you know, land cover types. And after these birds hatch, they typically prefer burned upland pine savannas compared to non-burned upland pine savannas. So if that burned patch um, is available, they're going to be looking to seek that, that area um, after they hatch. So let's talk a little bit about diet just to cover our bases. Uh, Bob Whites consume a ton of different things. Uh, they've actually been noted to consume over a thousand different food items and, and species of arthropods and, and plants. They're primarily granivorous, uh, eat seeds year all, all year round. And uh, during the spring and summer, arthropods are incredibly important for laying and, and chick production and chick uh, growth. Things like uh, 
beetles, true bugs, caterpillars, spiders. So uh, when we think about burning, um, you know, on a on a two-year fire return interval, uh, typically that more open uh, ground cover allows increased foraging, um, I guess, efficiency for broods. So even if the abundance of arthropods are the same between, a, say, a, a two-year rough versus a current year burn, the availability tends to be um, better for chicks just because of um, foraging efficiencies. And there's been a, a number of studies that have uh, demonstrated this. And then last but not least, um, some of the things that these birds are um, eating are, are greens and, and small fruit, like from sumac or, or dewberries. <clears throat> so I, I mentioned that broods are preferring for these uh, burned upland pines, um, these upland pine savannas, and there's a selection for them. So these, these are two graphs that kind of indicate that uh, where these dots are over zero, those are selection far. When they're under zero, that's an avoidance. And what we typically see, almost without exception, is that there's a, a selection for this BU, burned upland, um, regardless of whether it's diurnal or, or, or roost locations. There's an avoidance for hardwood drains and hardwood bottoms. Um, and typically a selection for fallow fields during the day, but they might um, avoid those um, during the night and, and just said another way. And um, we see that same thing here. Um, and this all depends on availability. That's why we don't see a strong uh, selection or avoidance here with this non-burned upland patch. But uh, nevertheless, uh, th there's a selection for the burn, burn patches most of the time. There might be an exception with uh, maybe a drought year and sandy soils or something like that, but most of the time we're going to see this selection. Now, we use these terms and read papers about burned upland pine savannas, and when I use when we throw these terms around, everybody gets a different image in their mind. So, what I thought might be helpful over the next couple of slides is just show a few photos of some areas that we've tracked birds. And um, so that we can all see the same thing and what we really mean by burned upland pine. And we'll dissect some of these images and, and some of the commonalities. So um, area to the left, uh, picture there is predominantly forbs, partridge peas, goldenrods, some grasses, uh, um, shrubs. It looks like some winged sumac. To the right, uh, it was actually a brood roost location with that American beauty berry. It's actually a burn patch. Y'all can see that. Um, from the shrub defoliation there. Um, and the red area arrow, again, as I said, it was, it was a roost location, um, probably only about two months after that area was burned. Note the open woodland um, situations and open pine situations. Different times a year, um, see still a, a composition of grasses, forbs, woody shrubs, some regen there on the left. And then on the right, again, grasses, forbs, shrubs. Um, some different areas. These were taken at different properties across the Red Hills. The one on the left was actually in, a, on, in southwest Georgia in the Albany region um, during a drought time period. But again, we see the same thing, open pine, uh, grasses, forbs, and shrubs. So what does Bob White have? What, what does this mean? Um, we typically mean, we're typically uh, burning to maintain this vegetation community um, and, and manipulating maybe when we burn and, um, and how we burn to, uh, to accomplish this. But what if, we, what if we just stop and what if it doesn't look like this? Well, many of you have probably seen some of these photos before. Um, these are photos taken from NB66. So this is one of the first studies that started, started uh, at Tall Timbers back in the 60s. And um, the photos are progressions through time. And what we see is that upper left-hand photo, there's a letter A on that pine tree. Um, you can geo-reference it to that letter A in the 1981 picture. And then in 2001, within a matter of 15 years, uh, it was not quail habitat anymore. It was, there were no, no forbs really, uh, very few shrubs. It's, it's mostly a, an you know, oak, hickory, um, sweet gum forest. And it's not only not quail habitat, but it's predator habitat. So when we're managing for, for a habitat for bobwhite, we're not only looking for what's conducive bobwhite habitat, but what we know is from our studies, and there's been a lot that has looked at both uh, mesomammal space use um, in the Southeast, as well as uh, how fire affects mesomammal communities and, and even raptors. Uh, typically, these are things that are harboring in the 1981 and 2001 um, photos, those are the things that are harboring uh, 
predators of quail. So we have a double whammy. Not only do we not have quail habitat at this point, but we're growing habitat for things that are adversaries for quail. Um, and we see this in, in a couple of um, a couple of data points I, I have up here. The upper right-hand photo is from a brood attract, uh, maybe in 2019 or so. Um, and it, it hatched where that red star was at. And you can see NB66, they avoided it like the plague. They used everything but it, then went up to right to the edge, and then they, they stayed outside of that NB66. And then looking at multiple locations over time, some of you may have also seen this figure before, but this is about 236,000 adult quail locations over many years at Tall Timbers. And that blue outline there is NB66. There were 312 locations out of 236,000 that were in that blue outline in this situation here. Only four were individuals that were alive when we picked up those um, or when we got that location. So um, when we talk about quail death traps, that's one of them. So <laughs> keep this all in mind about um, lack of fire, um, complete lack of fire space use and survival. There's just a few more examples and, and carrying this out. These, uh, the gray areas on these land cover maps are, are burned the current year, white were burned the previous year. And what we see is typically those red stars where the nest locations were at were in white areas. And a majority of the locations, the hollow circles being during the day and the black circles roost locations, most of them are gonna be in gray areas or, or along those fields, those beige, beige color there. And we see this most of the time, some selection for those burned uplands, for those broods, uh, if they're available to them. So we, we talked about uh, not burning, and, and uh, but we can't just, most of the Southeast looks like NB66, unfortunately. Can we just put fire back on the landscape and expect historical outcomes? Probably not. Um, and can we put fire back on the landscape when it used to burn and expect, uh, you know, things to be like they were? Probably not. And so something that I, I always I hear is that, well, fire used to burn at a certain time of the year, maybe June or July or, or May. And why aren't we burning then for Bob Whites? Because that makes sense. But um, a lot of things were different then than they are now. One, uh, we have to ask ourselves, were historical regimes, what did Bob White densities actually look like then? And Bob White probably were across a larger area. We don't have near the habitat fragmentation that we do today. Um, so can we burn under a, a truly natural paradigm in an anthropogenic landscape? And the answer is probably no. And so even on tall timbers, most of tall timbers had been farmed before it was deeded to the research station. So uh, what we see is that when we try to put fire back into um, to a system that isn't native ground cover anymore, maybe isn't wire grass, maybe we have to burn at a different time. And, and so there have, have been periods um, in tall timbers history where there was a shifting of, of fire timing just to mimic that natural fire cycle or that maybe lightning cycle but the vegetation didn't burn maybe like it used to because it was a different uh, vegetation community than, than was historically there. So we can't think of what, um, when we're burning far bob white, we have to think about how do I maximize bob white on the landscape today under current situations of fragmentation, the current plant communities that we uh, experience, and, and not so much like, well, what used to occur on the landscape 150 years ago. Um, because it might not be relevant today. In general, we want to manage with the principle of maintaining that vegetation community of predominantly forbs with native grasses, shrubs, and then bare ground. Now, when we apply fire and how we apply fire and fire's effects on creating and maintaining this vegetation community is going to depend, depend on a ton of different things. It could be soil uh, productivity and precipitation zones, um, plant communities, and, and interactions with other management. So as I mentioned, we can't expect to put fire back in a, um, a hardwood forest and, and it to thin out those trees. There's no fuels. There's nothing to, to get rid of those trees that are then there. So uh, we have to 
couple that with other management, perhaps thinning. We can't expect to put fire back into a, a you know, a industrial forest landscape, for example, that's maybe managed at 80 or 100 basal area, um, and expect that vegetation community to be grasses, forbs, shrubs with that composition, that structure that we need, um, just because that timber interaction and sunlight um, interfering with that whole process. So there's context that we need to be considerate of whenever uh, we manage. So the prescriptions will vary, but the principle is the same. We're managing for forbs, grasses, shrubs, and that general structure for those photos that we went through earlier, typically a couple feet tall, three and a half feet tall or less. The shrubs are usually head high or lower and, um, and scattered throughout that, throughout that landscape. So uh, that's the general principles, but what, what might those prescriptions look like a little bit more? Um, so as I mentioned already, we typically burn in on a, a two-year fire return interval in the Southeast. And the question is why? Well, it's to maintain that, that vegetation community in that, in that state of roughly equal parts, grasses, forbs, and shrub cover. And so many of you may have seen these photos before. These are of the Stoddard fire plots at Tall Timbers. And these fire plots were um, put in in 1958 or 59. So they've been burned consistently over the last 65 years on one, two, or three year fire return intervals. Um, and what we see in the one year fire return interval is that vegetation community is predominantly comprised of just grasses and some forbs, but we lack the shrub component. Right across the road, we in two year fire cycle, we see that, that total composition of grasses, forbs and shrubs. And it looks thick, but I, I promise you it's, it's not. That's one thing that a lot of folks might say, well, you know, that might get too thick for Bob White. Um, at, at ground level, it's not. A lot of those are forbs, they're stalky. They're not super dense at, in that first stratum of a couple inches. So um, that two year fire return interval is kind of what we're, we're aiming for. Once we get to three years, what we see is we're already managing that if we're applying fire every three years, it's grown out of quail habitat. We don't have that grass composition, have very few forbs, and it's pretty much just shrubs. So if we're burning every three years in a, in a soil that's highly productive, like these red clay loams, um, high precipitation, it's not going to be sufficient to sustain and, and maintain that vegetation community that we need for Bob White. So uh, maybe in some other soils, uh, we could get away with a three-year fire return interval, or maybe we just did a, a, a mid-story management and, and we're lacking shrub cover. Maybe we can get away with a three-year fire return interval. Um, but most of the time, we're going to be aiming for that two-year fire return interval. But, but it depends. It, it varies. So timing. Let, let's talk about timing. I mentioned about February through May being a, a time period in which m was considered maybe the industry standard on, on the properties that still sustain good bobwhite populations in the Southeast. Um, earlier, maybe in, in Central and South Florida, maybe in February and March, and then in, in the Red Hills, it might be March, and April, maybe burning into May, but there's a lot of things to consider when we talk about fire timing as well. So not just the, the plant composition and, and the, the um, response after burning, but also that, that nexus and that interaction between cover and predation risk for Bob White. So we always have to ask ourselves, what is, uh, before we burn, what is our objective for burning? Even the properties that are, have been burnt every year for the last 100 years have an objective for burning. Um, it's usually to maintain that, that ground cover community um, in what it is, and they might manipulate manipulate their timing um, a little later to get a hotter burn for, uh, for woody cover kill, or they might um, shift it earlier to um, stimulate forbs or, or, or woody cover. It really depends on the ground cover that's there. So the next question really depends. It's like, okay, well, if, um, if we're arguing for a March and April uh, burn window, um, what, what if I don't even have quail yet and uh, I have an issue with woody, woody cover well, whether a population is present is really important. So if we don't have quail at all and, and we need to do some woody cover management, then, then those fall burns, which are becoming pretty popular, um, is definitely a tool in our toolbox um, because there's not a population present. And we don't have to worry about maybe burning in the fall, reducing cover without much uh, regrowth during the overwinter. Um, 
we, we don't have to worry about that because those birds quite, aren't quite there yet. If we do have a population, what we see in the graph to the right is November uh, on all the three properties that we um, manage in North Florida and South Georgia. November is a, a time of year that we see a huge influx of, of raptors. Um, and we also see this in November, uh, November and in and, and February. But uh, November is a, is a pinch point for quail when it comes to raptor migration, which are the probably leading cause of uh, predator, le leading predator for quail in the southeast. So the timing of our burning can in, or interact with that that predation uh, that that cycle in that system. So that's all important to remember. And even when we're burning in February, March, April, May, uh, we might want to space it out through time. We might not all want to burn just at once. We might um, burn here and then there. It might, if it takes two months, that's okay. Um, and we know the timing of nesting season. And, and we know that, uh, hey, if we, we burn into May, really only maybe 20% of our nests are, are laid by May and in North Florida. So the probability if we so say if we didn't get all our burning done by that time of the year, the probability that one of our nests being in one of those blocks that we didn't get to is pretty low. Um, so get your burning done. Frequency is much more important than timing when it comes to uh, burning. But if we can get our frequency right, then we would definitely want to get our timing right. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, context is incredibly important. If we're managing a system, maybe that has native wire grass, we might be burning later into the year, May, or maybe even June, or uh, versus old field vegetation that might be a little earlier. Um, and so here's just another example of, um, of the whole raptor migration deal. But uh, yeah, so there's a lot of things that we have to take into consideration when it comes to timing. But typically, we want to be out of the woods uh, most of May, June, July, and August during that nesting season, if we can. Other things are to consider, are there post-burn mechanical options? And so in the Red Hills, a popular uh, management uh, approach to say, if we're, we're burning in, in March and April, it's after the hunting season, it's before the nesting season, uh, seems to maintain that vegetation community. In those really productive soils, those woody plants can sometimes stay ahead of us. And every maybe eight, 10 years, maybe once, twice a decade, we might have to come through there and do some post-burn mechanical or post-burn chopping to follow that up. And uh, so if these are options, it's one way of saying we can still get that woody cover uh, objective accomplished and do it at the right at the time of the year that might be most favorable for, favorable for quail. So uh, after we burn, say in March or April, we might allow um, some regrowth in, in that those woody, uh, woody plants to use some of that root reserves back up into the, the stems and then go through there and damage a little bit more with, uh, with roller chopping and, and, and tree, uh, using the tree cutter to kind of set that back. So there are other tools that we can, that we, we can interact with fire. Fire doesn't have to be our only tool. And if it is, then we have to be a lot more flexible on fire timing. But if we have these, these other tools in our um, toolbox that are available to us, um, it's something to consider when it comes to timing and, um, and accomplishing the same objectives. So we talked about frequency, timing. Let's talk about scale. This is always something that everybody likes to talk about. Typically when we're burning for Bob Whites, smaller is better, almost as small as logistically possible. So we have to remember that the home range size of a Bob White is about 50 acres. So if they're using certain areas, 70% of these nests are being hatched in non-burned uplands and they're preferring burned uplands for foraging and different things like that. Um, we would like for any point on the landscape to have all of those resources available to a bird um, when they hatch out. So when we, when we burn at scales 20 to 50 acres, the odds are they're gonna have availability of, uh, of those multiple land cover types in juxtaposition to each other and available to um, those birds. So uh, we can burn larger in different shapes and still have equal, uh, equal availability for birds. So something that someone, uh, some of our partners do in, uh, in central Florida is that they, they burn a little larger, but 
they burn in, in different types of uh, different shapes. So they can get away with a little larger in the effective area that's, uh, you know, I guess away from protective cover is still relatively small. The interior of the burn isn't large. Um, so typically what we see with large square burns is that we have larger home rangers, lower brood growth rates, uh, lower adult survival, and we typically have higher bobwhite densities uh, on those areas that have smaller scale burns. Now, like I said, that there's a diminishing returns probably uh, below 20 acres or so. So there's been a handful of studies that looked at fire scale. Um, the, the graph to the right is from Wellendorf and, and Palmer. And uh, they looked at fires effects on demographics between five acre and 20 acre blocks. And they found some, some use for the small scale burns versus large scale, but um, some years it didn't have much of an effect. In 2005, we didn't see too much of an effect. But so what they said was like, hey, you know, when you get this to this scale, it, it's probably not worth it. But once we start getting much larger, that um, fire scales that we often see applied on, on public lands or on, on large, large properties, what we see is that as we go larger, the number of coveys that we tend to see um, associated with those areas tends to go down. So if we have the ability to burn at a smaller scale, we want to do that. We want to still get the um, half that area burned a year, but we have to do so, I guess, strategically and, and tactfully so that we can accomplish the same amount of burning, but also at the same time, uh, not burn up completely around a, an, an individual to where they're exposed to predation, have to make super large movements um, and things of that nature. So, so scale is incredibly important. So really that, just to kind of sum, summarize all this is that uh, there's not a one size fits all prescription. It really depends on, on your situation. Um, it, that one situation for one, one stand won't be different for another. Uh, it depends on timber, it depends on plant communities, if there's uh, exotic grasses or native ground cover or, or what we have. Um, and fire and loan is incredibly important, but might not be the only tool that we wanna consider when we're trying to maintain habitat um, for bobwhite. And so, uh, and, the, and then we also have to recognize that the context of the current population is also incredibly important. So while we have these principles that we try to adhere to for maximizing quail production, uh, it, it really depends on your situation. If you can accomplish those same principles through different prescriptions, then do it. Uh, that, that's the main, um, the main point there. But uh, if we have a lot of uh, birds already on an area, we want to definitely not see a decline in that area. We want to be super diligent in when we apply fire and how we accomplish those objectives that um, maintain high survival and high reproduction. So with that, I appreciate your attention today. Um, and I'll take any of your burning questions. All right, well, Dr. Kubetska, thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, I, I know we're gonna have some questions come in. We still have quite a few, over 160 people on the line. Once again, if you, joined my, if you joined the presentation, my name is David Godwin and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange with the University of Florida. Uh, we just enjoyed a presentation from Dr. Brad Kubetska, who's with Tall Timbers Research Station and works in the uh, Piney Woods region in Texas. Uh, at this point in our program, we do have time remaining uh, for you to ask questions. Uh, you can go ahead and put those questions, please, into the Q&A tool in Zoom, and that'll help us to kind of sort through those questions uh, to get to uh, the ones that we can in the time remaining. If you see a question that somebody else has asked, please give it a thumbs up. And that'll help us to prioritize some of those uh, burning questions. All right, let's get over to the Q&A tool and see what we've got. Quite a few already. All right, here's one. Uh, any insight on balancing some hardwood management with quail management while minimizing those uh, predation effects? Yeah. Um... It, it's all about trade-offs, I guess. Uh, most of the, the the industry standard today is to remove uh, many of those hardwoods, especially that those that aren't uh, fire tolerant. Things like water oaks that might be in our uplands because of fire suppression. Um, whereas 
you know, large hardwoods, we, what we call legacy hardwoods. We might um, maintain, you know, one every five acres, some, some of those big live oaks, red oaks, things, things of that nature. Um, but there's going to be a trade-off there with, with raptor perches, with uh, snake habitat, with, with uh, habitat for, for mesomammals, and we have expanses of those. So, uh, you know, that, take that for what it is. Uh, birds definitely, Bob White definitely use oak canopy it, when, say if it's a live oak canopy, when that's the only kind of shade they might have. They have some properties that have very, very low uh, pine basal area, but they have a, a lot of live oak and we do see them use that. Um, but again, ground cover is incre incredibly important and it's, uh, it's interspersed. The, those trees are interspersed within a matrix of high quality ground cover. So um, typically we try to reduce that as much as much as possible. And then um, I'm not sure if this was what the person was asking, but do you have guidance on sites where it may not be a pine dominated stand and maybe the, the dominant oh, yeah. stand that they're managing for may be hardwood species. I'm thinking, um, you know, certainly north of where we are, um, but up into Tennessee or Northern Alabama, um, where, where hardwoods may be the, the featured product that they're managing for. Yeah, a hundred percent. So again, we want to keep that, that canopy open. So obviously we can throw basal area out the, out the window, but we can talk more about is, do, does the amount of our hardwood cover, is it suppressing our growth from our ground cover? Cause that's, that's where the rubber meets the road for Bob White. They don't care about trees necessarily. Um, that's why we see them from prairies to these pine systems. So uh, if, if we're at a density of hardwoods that isn't suppressing um, proper structure and good uh, vegetation diversity at the ground level, then, then we're probably good. So it's gonna depend on the type of, of species that we have and the density of, of hardwoods. We had a question that came in from our Facebook live stream. And uh, this is a good one. This comes from Paul. And Paul is asking about how do you think that Bob White serve as a sentinel species for other wildlife? Um, are, are they going to be uh, kind of a, an indicator for small mammals, for turkeys, uh, for other things that you might also be interested in managing for? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a lot of studies how, that indicate that this small scale um, fire approach is beneficial for turkeys. We know that the, the private quail properties in the Red Hills and, and South Georgia host the highest density of RCW populations on private lands in the United States. So um, managing in, in these, these fashions, open pond savanna, um, frequent fire, small scale is benefiting all those. Uh, obviously, if we don't have a ton of shrubs, that's creating a root mass that's helping burrowing animal, animals like gopher tortoises and a lot of other um, burrowing animals. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, fire is helping a wide range of species services um, from carbon sequestration and reducing wildfire risk. We could go on and on about how, how Bob White and managing specifically for Bob White um, could benefit a wide range of other species. There's been some other uh, maybe species that we try to coattail off of but you know i would i would argue that when we manage for bob white it, it's the pinnacle <laughs> in that if we have bob white good bob white populations we have a lot of those other species but if we manage for some of those other species we might not have bob white or some other things so uh yeah there's there's a wide range of things that we're accomplishing when we apply fire uh, uh, consistently at smaller scales and uh, yeah Right, here's a question, and it, it touches on that uh, issue of scale. Um, and this is something I had made a note from your presentation I was going to ask you about as well. Uh, Ray added into the Q&A tool in Zoom, and um, Ray is talking about burning uh, uh, south of I-4, so um, central and south Florida areas. And he's talking about burning uh, in larger burns, uh, between 300 and 1500 acres uh, on a one and a half to two year interval. And, but they're burning in June and July. And so what they're seeing by burning in June and July is what Ray's typed in here is, you know, they're getting patchier burns by moving into 
uh, later into that growing season period of time. So that's kind of a backstory that Ray has provided and I'm interested in as well. How does uh, patchiness of burns, um, does that open up burning later into that growing season window? How does that play an effect in, in managing for Bob White? Yeah, you know, I can't say that I have familiarity with any studies that kind of looked at the patchiness within burns. I mean, we could argue that we could have a 2000 acre burn and light in on the edges and then it goes out 10 feet in and it's not a good continuous burn, but I don't know if continuity of burns has really been taken into to consideration a whole bunch in the literature. Um, you know, down there in that part of Florida, it's getting really wet that time of year. Um, you know, the, I, I try to avoid kind of some of the, the words and terms that we use a lot, mosaics and patchiness. I, I, I kind of just go out there and as for Bob White's and I'm looking for, are we accomplishing our objectives? And if that patchiness is allowing shrub growth in areas that we need it, and, um, you know, we're getting burns in where areas that we need it, then we've accomplished our objective. But uh, it, it really depends. Actually, some of those data that I had presented were from South Florida, at least for Bob White. Some of these larger burns and those 1,500-acre burns were on some WMAs and, and private properties in South Florida. So, uh, you know, I would be curious as to if we're accomplishing those objectives um, that time of year down there for Bob White. And uh, there, there's also that issue with, of course, uh, with nest on the ground in, in June. But, um, you know, that's, I don't know about the patchiness question though. You know, if, if it goes out and, and we have a huge patches of, of areas that aren't getting burned, well, those are refugia, obviously, that birds could be using. So I guess it de depends on the pa the degree of patchiness. And, and so, and, and then we get into really gray area there. Um, so yeah, arguably we could maybe get away with larger burns if it's super patchy. Um, but I don't know that uh, many managers that are, trying to get a patchy burn or a not you know discontinuous burn that you know that mostly trying to blacken it out <laughs> so that that gets to a question we had from from langfrey in the q a um are do, do you have suggestions or on uh, ignition techniques or thinking about you know just the you know how are we burning the blocks are our issues with um, ringing it out? Is that a concern because we have, you know, a wildlife species in here that we're really managing for? Um, do are the managers that you're uh, talking with that are on really successful sites? Are they really trying to get black from one end of the units to the other? Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So most of the the quail properties have moved to kind of a block burning method. Um, right, lighting back fires, back and fires, flanking fires, and running head fires into there. Um, historically, ring arounds were really common, and uh, you know only small refugia were left for far nesting. And it kind of gets at that whole patchy thing. Um, most most properties have kind of done away with that um, because it's been easier for them to use that blocking method. Um, again, it all goes back to objectives. You know, there's been some areas that we might have really grassy areas, um, or it might be really grassy, want more consumption, then we might be talking about back and fires versus head fires. It all depends on that objective and what we're trying to accomplish with our vegetation community. I think um, it will dictate how maybe we should be lighting those fires. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, it, it just depends. I'd say most of the time, um, folks are just going to be, you know, having a, a backing fire and, and flank fire and then run a head fire right in the middle. Typically, most of the time trying to get fairly continuous burns. So uh, burning with lower humidities, relatively low, um, relatively low humidities, um, you know, 30, 40 percent, uh, maybe up to 50 percent. And then in good wind speeds, trying to get you know, good burns. Here's an interesting question from Kurt. And I'm going to read it straight so I, I get to the gist of it. Kurt says, as the best habitats for quail today are also the best remaining habitats for many longleaf savanna reptiles and amphibians. We have concerns about missing the opportunities to burn wetlands when they are dry, often summer. Do you have suggestions such as blackening uplands for quail early to avoid nesting impacts, but then come back later in the summer to burn just when 
just the wetlands so to come back just and burn the wetlands because the outer areas were blackened earlier. Um, do you have any thoughts on that you'd like to share? Yeah, I, th I think that's a great idea, really, you know, because those wetland areas probably aren't high use areas by quail. They probably don't have a high preference for them. Um, they might use them, but I don't know that they would necessarily select for them. So, uh, you know, I, I would, I could probably see a situation in which we manage those almost slightly separately or consider them as, um, you know, however we need to, um, to accomplish those objectives as well. Yeah. So, uh, with wetlands, a lot of, a lot, I think a lot of some of our species like reptiles and amphibians are going to be using areas that maybe aren't great quail habitat inherently. Um, maybe they don't burn well because there are low bottoms or wetlands or whatever. And so some, some of those areas, you know, folks just don't do much. They'll burn into them. They use them at burn breaks and all that stuff. But when it comes to, to quail habitat, um, you know, it's not like we're going to go through there and try to do something too special. We know that they're inherently limited. So uh, do with that as you will. All right. And uh, last question I want to get to you in here. We've, we're getting up to the end of our time. Uh, TJ has asked in the Q&A, uh, could you comment, did the 20 to 50 percent re-nesting apply only to nest loss due to fire or was that all causes? That's all causes. Um, so that's just if if a hen fails a nest, the probability that they re-nest isn't 100 percent. So when, when folks say, oh, they're re-nesters, then just write it off. We don't need to write it off. We don't want to, because remember survival is super low. Every month, the probability that we have, that we're going to survive to the next month is 90%, actually by 89%, 89 to the, you know, 0.89 to the 12th power is about 20%. Um, so if we put them in a situation that they have to re-nest, it's going to take 15 days to lay and 23 days to incubate. Are they going to survive that long? Um, so we have a saying that dead hens don't lay eggs. So uh, we want that first success um, to be, nest to be successful. Um, so that, it doesn't include just fire. It, it's all all losses, but uh, you know, a loss is a loss in, in terms of demographic data. All right. Well, it looks like we've run up to the end of our time today. Uh, Dr. Kubeshka, do you have any final comments or remarks that you would like to share with folks? No, I appreciate the opportunity to get to talk to y'all today. And um, if y'all have any questions um, or hate mail, bkabechka at talltimbers.org. Uh, my uh, cell phone was also there. there there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of great great work that's being done throughout the Southeast with different groups, uh, Tall Timbers, and, uh, Quail Forever, and, and a lot of public lands and state agencies working hard. And uh, if, if I can't help you, I could probably put you in contact with some of the good people that can. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your presentation. I've learned things today. Um, it's always, always a pleasure. Thanks.